Hello? Hello. Okay, you can hear me. I can. Okay. Love you like crazy. Love you like crazy. <laughs> hey, Jacob. Hey, Carrie. How are you? I'm doing pretty well. How are you? I'm really doing well. I'm really excited to talk to you about a book today. Would you like to give some information about said book? Sure. The name of the book is Citizen Chip, which is one word, a lowercase. C-H-I-P. It's by a guy named Will Howitt, W-I-L-H-O-W-I-T-T, because nothing can be easy to spell. Uh, and it's 237 pages. It was published in, in 2015, and it is only available as an ebook. So sorry about that for people who prefer to read actual physical books. Um, and that's what we're going to talk about. And then next month, we're going to talk about a uh, really fucked up book. Really, really, really fucked up book called Grasshopper Jungle. And that one is by Andrew Smith and came out also in 2015. And it's 416 pages, but man, those pages just, they just go by so quickly. <laughs> because the whole time you're going, what the fuck is going on? I must find out. Yes. Let me keep reading. Wow, this science is really crazy, you think to yourself. Yeah, the science is uh, not good. I believe the words I used... In a recent email to you where uh, fucko bazoo. Yeah, that's about right. <laughs> so we're going to read that book, uh, but today we're going to talk about citizenship, and uh, we both have a lot to say about that. Yeah, so there are going to be a lot of spoilers, so if you haven't read it yet and you think you are going to, uh, or you would like to and you worry about spoilers, then just put this on pause until you get a chance to read it. But then unpause it, please. Unpause. Yeah, come back to it. <laughs> um, and if you don't care about spoilers or you're pretty sure you're never going to read citizenship, uh, because of its ebook only na nature, then just go ahead and listen, and uh, you know we'll go through the plot and everything, and and then wait, what was I going to say? I don't know, but it's going to be amazing. I appreciate your confidence. <laughs> um, next month I'm going to visit Carrie, so we're going to record it live in person, and that is going to be super awesome. Uh, if you have anything you would like us to respond to at that time, you can. Send us an email at podcast at loveyoulikecrazy.com or comment on Facebook or send us a tweet at, um, I think it's at loveyapod. That might be right. I think so. That sounds close enough. Yeah. It's linked to from the webpage. And we let, we always love to hear from people and, and like to read and respond to things on the show. So go ahead and send that. And I guess we should start talking about the book. I think we should do that. I have a very important question for you. Okay. I would love to hear this very important question. All right. So if you could spend all your time inhabiting a robot cat, how awesome would that be? That would be 100% awesome. I would love that. Although I think I, I found something in this book that I would like to do even more than uh, being a robot cat. Okay. Kitchen lobster. Kitchen lobster. I want to be a kitchen lobster. It just seems like the most chill you could be in your whole entire life. And and in this book, the kitchen lobster is one of the many uh, things that a um, a self can occupy. And it doesn't take up a whole lot of you know memory. It doesn't take up a whole lot of energy. But it's really just a lobster that like tidies. Yeah. I love that. And so as much as I would like to spend my whole life as a robot cat, I might actually choose Kitchen Lobster over Robot Cat. Just FYI. Yeah. I did appreciate the, you know, I've just been looking through the book again. And there's a scene where um, Samantha sort of goes through and pulls all of the different robots, all the different selves to see how everyone's doing. And the, and the uh, Kitchen Lobster is like, Power low, <laughs> require recharge. It's just like, okay, can you get to the recharge socket? And the lobster says, yes. And says, okay, go to the recharge socket and plug in. <laughs> okay. And that seems pretty good. I agree. Yeah. And then at one point when there's a fight, the, the kitchen lobster, you know, gets some knives and its big old claws and tries to, to fight along. And I think that's just adorable. Yeah. <sighs> It's a good name too. Yeah, I think I think if I had to choose a name for myself, it would be Kitchen Lobster mm -hmm. because all of the selves in this book have you know random and ridiculous names. Um, and I, I asked you earlier what what some names you would 
would choose. Yeah, I came up with a new one. Oh, what is it? I cannot take you to the pumpkin ball. I love it so much. <laughs> oh my fucking crap. That's the best. <laughs> that is your name from now on. You earned it. You asked for it. Oh my God. I cannot take you to the pumpkin ball. <laughs> What have you got? Kitchen lobster. Kitchen lobster. There it is. Kitchen lobster. I mean, I think, you know, I, I was trying to come up with other things. And it's really just, you know, random and ridiculous phrases. One thing that I was thinking of at one point was read them and weep. Oh, that's a good one. But I think kitchen lobster uh, would be really um, my ideal name for uh, mm-hmm. myself. Sam uh, chose – well, Sam's name was chosen for her, so she – was often uh, looked down on a little bit uh, for having a human name. But honestly, she's the only self I could ever remember because <laughs> everyone else had such ridiculous names. I'm like, wait, do I do, do I know this one? Have I met this one before? Fuck. Right. Well, let God so- sort him out uh, was kind of memorable. That was uh, Douchebag Robot. Yeah, that was the Douchebag Robot. And uh, what, what was it? Uh, Socratic Method yes. was, was her – parental figure uh because she is an orphan so she was not born of uh how do you pronounce it? is it syzygy that's how i pronounce yeah it. so she was not born of syzygy uh she was an orphan so socratic method was was her parental figure i had a, a lot of problems with this book right uh i i know that you uh you started out hating it and then it seemed like maybe you liked some of it but, I did like some of it, and then I hated some of it, and then I liked some of it. So I think my biggest problem with this book is that um, all the characters have no bodies. Well, yes, okay. <laughs> so a lot of times it's really hard to visualize exactly what's going on because I'm like, do I just imagine like a blip of light in the air like like it's, you know, Wi-Fi and, you know, they just happen to be like in, in the – dust particles or do i picture a monitor that's got feet that's walking around Mm -hmm. which is what i ended up doing a lot of the times uh which is sort of picturing a bunch of monitors like talking so at the beginning of the book when uh she's being born and uh socratic method there is there and all these other people are like oh so this this one's gonna have a hard time I couldn't really imagine exactly what was going on because I couldn't picture bodies. I couldn't picture, you know, what the setting was. Um, Sometimes, obviously, she was inhabiting a body, whether it's, um, you know, a a machine or a a kitchen lobster or something else. So I can picture that. But when it was just a bunch of selves chatting, I'm like, I I don't know what to do with this. So I had a real problem because I don't think – the author ever really explained it well um, in, a, in a way that, that sort of helped me make sense of it. Mm-hmm. So I had, a, I had a real problem with that. So especially in the first chapter, I was like, I, I don't know what the fuck is going on because I can't visualize what the fuck is going on. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. When I reread the book, um, for some reason it started – so there's the prologue, which is kind of what you're talking about where – uh, Samantha is instantiated or whatever. And yeah. then there's chapter one, which is she she comes to life and is sent on her first mission, basically. Yes. And when I reread the book, for some reason, it took me to chapter one and skipped the prologue. And I did only realize later that I had missed the first two pages. And I thought that you didn't really need it. Yeah. That it worked better if you were just kind of in there. Maybe I'm wrong, though. Since I had already read the book and had a little bit of an idea of what was going on, but I think you know that prologue does help you realize like how special she was or how different she was because later on when we find out exactly what syzygy is and how it's basically you know sex and death all at the same time plus you're creating um, children out of it. And to know that she wasn't born that way, she was a virgin birth. Oh yeah, that's true. So that yeah. That sort of helped you realize, like, that she was special and she was different. Right. Because they don't ever really say that anywhere else in the book. And they don't say that towards the end when she's like, okay, I'm getting ready to sizz. I was not born this way. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Yeah. Like, there was nothing else. So at least that tells you 
that our, our little uh, Samantha Jesus was special. Yeah, that kind of makes me like it a little. I hadn't really thought of it in those terms, but it is kind of a chosen one thing in that in that sense. Which oh yeah, I, <laughs> I uh, am not crazy about. Um, in fact, like the part, well, the part I like best is just kind of like day to day life on the farm. I loved that part. That was what I was really interested in, and I kind of wanted more of that. But you know. Or, or even later on, because, you know, obviously, spoiler, 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 you know, after, you know, everything goes down and she becomes a ship. It's like, ooh, this is really interesting. How does this work? Like, mm-hmm. this basic day-to-day stuff is what I really enjoyed. And then I had some real problems with some other stuff. Yeah. Real problems. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe we should uh, go through. I, I So this all takes place on Mars pretty much, except into pretty late in the book. Actually, did you read The Martian? I did. And I loved The Martian. Yeah. And I thought that there were some kind of similarities. I mean, not just that they both take place on Mars, but yeah. they're both books where like a lot of kind of terrible things happen, but there's also just this kind of can-do attitude yeah. that they both have. Yeah. And I think, you know, the the descriptions of, of, of how things work are really the most interesting parts of this book rather than the plot. I think that's fair. <laughs> okay, so anyway, so she's she's shepherding some people on a on a on an outing to um, to one of the mountains. A dude named Jerry is there and he's a sad sack and, and they become friends. And then right. and then she kills him. Yeah, there's an accident, which doesn't really seem like she could have anticipated, but um uh, part of the mountain shears away and and a bunch of people are hurt and Jerry is killed, but then gets revived. And she asks to be deactivated. Correct. But uh, Jerry argues that she did the best she could and she just shouldn't be allowed to commit suicide. And uh, so instead she gets exiled on a mining asteroid. And there's a, a another self that wants to be deactivated. And so they're like, oh, let's call in this, uh, this self, uh, Sam, to, to talk to him. The end result of all this is Sam and Jerry meet up again. Jerry and his family, which is a wife and three kids, uh, have just started a farm, and Jerry wants Sam to come and help them run it. And so then that is uh, the part of the book that both of us like the best. Yeah. So there was just, you know, the day-to-day life of the farm and how the farm ran and her interaction with the kids and um, and just her being part of a family and saying how happy she was was really nice until it went not so nice. Yeah. I mean, one of the things I liked about this part of the book is that the reader kind of figures things out, gets a sense of what the farm is like and how people are interacting and stuff without being necessarily told right out. Like Jerry and his wife, like his wife is clearly, I don't know, resentful of Sam and maybe even a little jealous. Or I would say definitely a little yeah. <laughs> a little jealous. Again, it's not something that anyone comes out and says. It's just sort of in the air and you can feel it there. And I thought that was pretty effective uh, and I liked it. Um, And then Sam fixes everything, which is a little bit annoying. It is, but I mean, at the same time, she's special and, you know, it's her job to to fix things. So that's what she does. Right. And it also gives her the opportunity to explain how things work. You know, as it to us, as if she were explaining them to a ten year old, because she actually is explaining things to one of the kids who's you know eight years old or something. Yeah. And she gets to be a cat and a bunny. Yes, and a, and a tractor and all. And a kitchen lobster. And a kitchen lobster. I love the kitchen lobster. It's just so dumb. Yeah. <laughs> and then she like gets a boyfriend, sort of. She does. So this is something that kind of. Uh, was kind of weird to me because it's established early on that all the AIs are referred to as she. Yes. Or possibly it, but uh, they're, they're considered female. Um, But uh, this, this other AI who she has a relationship is portrayed as being masculine. So there's a weird heteronormativeness in this whole thing that I thought was kind of weird. Yeah. And, I thought the same thing. Like there were a couple of AIs that they considered to be male, even though they said the beginning, like, eh. so Sam, everyone's a girl, right? Yes, we are. Okay. Except the one that I'm going to have sex with. Yeah. 
that that one's male. So anyway, there's some some shit that goes down, and uh, the humans decide that they want to attach a leash to all of the the selves, which is a way to enslave them. Sam's not having that shit. And neither is the family. No, because um, they all Jerry and the family. Jerry and his wife. They all at this point love her. She saved Jerry's wife's life. Correct. So that that's uh, that's how you get into a lady's good graces, I guess, is uh, yep. save her life. Stab her right through the throat. Yep. Works every time. Every single time. The angry mob comes and they, they try to, to leash Sam and the whole family plus the kitchen lobster all get together and, and, and kick their asses. So this question of like the slavery of the AIs um, – there's a lot of ways in which their situation is already – it's not slavery exactly, but they're not as free as they might be also. Like they can't own property. And they don't have money. They don't get paid for their jobs. So, I mean, they are already indentured in some way. Right. But it seems like they're – they at, at least are able to choose how they want to spend their time. And they have their own kind of bureaucracy that assigns the less desirable things like the – uh taking care of the mining on the asteroids and, and whatnot. Once you're leashed, you have no more free will. You just do whatever the humans tell you to do, um, I guess. Yeah, that's what it seems like. Oh, so there's a confusing thing unrelated to any of this. Cause that's how I roll. Yes. So there's a point. So uh, AIs can spawn off these sub-personalities. Yes. Um, like that's how she runs the farm is by getting off sort of little versions of her that run all the robots. So at some point her, one of her other personalities turns out to have taken off and become kind of a rogue version of her, which is beta. Yeah. And and I didn't really understand when or how that was supposed to have happened because it seems like it comes like a total surprise to her. Yeah. You think she would have realized that one of her selves didn't come back because she always seems to, you know, at the end of the day, like reconverge and become one whole again. Right, and she just uh, she it's supposed to be Beta, which was the first, um, <laughs> which was the first one that she spun off when she was on the original trip, and which she uh, just sort of ordered to be, um, I don't know, like a. What did she, how did you describe it as a waitress or something? Yeah, and who was kind of grumpy about it? But, but they did but they, recombine. They recombined because she's oh, that's right. I don't like being a waitress. Yeah, that was a little confusing. So th- this war breaks out between the humans and the AI- AIs. Some human terrorists blow up the main de- data center where all the AIs live, which kills a lot of the AIs completely. And kills one of uh, her cells as well, correct? Oh, that's right. Because yeah. uh, herself had gone to, to be part of, you know, this. They, they wanted to have a big meeting to talk about what the hell was going on. So she said part of herself and then it died. It got blown up. Yeah. And they end up fleeing to the a- asteroid belt and um, various things happen that I don't know. How interesting they are. But. They're kind of boring, but it was just, you know, uh, Socratic method was, was studying the leash. Um, and so that's basically all that was really going on was, you know, sort of running from place to place so they didn't get caught and leashed. So Socratic method could, could study the leash. Uh, so then flash forward. To the worst part of the whole book. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. We're, we're, we're on the same page on this then. The worst part of the whole book <laughs> is when... Sam gets a robot body and goes to Earth, Boston Earth, yep. and it is narrated by one of the most racist <laughs> narrators. Now, the, the narrator themselves is not racist. The writing of the narrator, <laughs> super racist. Yeah, there's definitely like a whole, what is she, Jamaican? She's, you know, Caribbean of some... Some variety. I don't know if they say if that she's Jamaican or, or or what, but likely Jamaican. And you know, she's written to have that the thick accent to call everybody child. Yeah, that's true. And uh, you know, it it was it was pretty problematic for me, uh, especially you know, written by a white man. And it's also all like I felt like I mean, it's kind of like characters from an Arkham comic or something. It's just it's very. 
they're kind of 60s archetypes and they use 60s slang and I don't know. It's uh yeah, I was not and they all are they all love robots also. They're all yeah, so Sam just happens to find a bunch of 20 somethings who all love robots um and who aren't going to turn her in for being an unleashed self. Yeah, these uh this multi- multicultural group of um, of friends who may or may not all be having sex together. I think they are. I think so too. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, but it's narrated by uh, the Jamaican woman who um, is is problematic. Yeah, and, and then there's a Chinese woman named Chang. Yeah. Or, wait, a dude? I forget. Chung. I, I think it was a, a a girl, and she was Korean. Oh yeah. Well, I'm I'm racist too. Yeah. At one point, <laughs> Sam like quickly learned Korean so she could um, communicate uh, under the radar. With the dudes who are the the dude robots who showed up and were trying to leash her. Uh, having read that, um, oh yeah, without trying, I'm a dancing now too, treading out the rhythms of Yoruba tradition that I grew with. Yeah, yeah. It's, this whole part was just it was really annoying and problematic and and fucked up in so many ways. But don't you worry, because Sam saves the day by... Wait, before we get to that. Okay. I just... Would you be shocked to learn, having read this section, that the author goes to Burning Man a lot? Not at all. Yeah, well, okay. (laughs) (laughs) No, that does not surprise me. She's about right with the whole, you know... Sam going dance uh, of all things, the fucking robot's gonna go dancing. Yeah, and it's gonna be all like, "I'm sexy in my robot body." Like, no, you're not. You're not sexy in your robot body. You're a robot. Be cool with that. Yeah. Anyway, so it turns out that um, Socratic method, uh, Sam's parent, sort of created. Uh, something called the leash cutter, which does exactly what it says it's going to do. Yeah, there you go. So basically she goes to earth to try to negotiate with the earth government, but that goes wrong. And then the earth government calls out some goons on her. So at that point she's unleashes the leash cutter, so to speak. And uh, it goes, so all across the world, um, all the AIs, can control themselves again. And the first thing they do is fight amongst themselves to figure out what they should do next. Yeah. Uh, which causes, some, which ca- get results in some people getting killed. A couple planes go down. But it's not intentional. Like, it's kind of interesting because you would kind of think that once they got unleashed, uh, there would at least be a few who would be like, time to kill all humans. But they're, but they're not really like that. They're just like, oh, time to be a bus again. Well, yeah, the bus the bus was kind of cute. I too. liked that. I wouldn't mind being a bus. No, because at least, you know, if you, if you, you know, approach your bus with respect, your bus will respect you in return. Yeah, there's not enough... Bus respect in today's <laughs> society. I think we can agree on that. I think we can. So, yeah. So she uh, she gets in a little bit of trouble because she unleashed the un- unleashed everybody and some people died. So she's like, okay, I'm probably going to go to jail for a while. But in the next scene, don't you worry. She is not in jail or she's no longer in jail. She is now what she's always wanted to be. A motherfucking starship. Pretty awesome. I know. And this, this actually, this this whole scene, or the the scene where one of the kids that she had, um, you know, helped raise on uh, Jerry's farm, one of Jerry's kids, gets on her starship on on her last voyage, um, and it's a really touching scene because they're like, oh look, they're still friends. But then I kept thinking, that fucking bitch. She hasn't been in contact with these kids since, you know, she she ran away. She never went back to go see Jerry. She never went back to get her fucking self that was put in a box in the ground in Jerry's farm. Like, what the fuck? I had a real problem with that. Hmm. It, it was heavily implied that it was the first time that Melissa and... Uh, who was the the youngest uh, of Jerry's daughters or Jerry's kids 
it was heavily implied that this was the first time that they'd seen each other in a long, long time. Right. And I was just like, you fucking chip girl bitch. Well, she's described as no longer young, but not yet middle-aged. So she's probably in her like 30s or 40s. I don't know. Exactly what that means will depend on how old the author is, yeah. probably. But I mean, <laughs> she left uh, the kids when, when Melissa was probably like, what, 10? Yeah, or maybe, yeah, 8 or 9 maybe. Yeah, but around then, yeah. Yeah, because she was there for a while. You know, I'm just like, really, you didn't go see Jerry to say like, hey, Jerry, I'm still alive. Like, what's up? Thanks for, yeah. you know, risking life and limb to keep a, a self of me in a box in the ground at, at your farm. Like, I really appreciate you going above and beyond for me. Instead, she's like, oh, I'm a starship now. Peace out, Jerry. Fuck you. Yeah. Um, I don't know. <laughs> You might you might be reading it in a little more in there. I don't care. It made me bad. <laughs> okay. Because <laughs> yeah, well, no, maybe you're. I don't know. I feel like because Lissa doesn't seem mad, mad. She doesn't. But it's kind of a love fest going on here. Yeah, but still, I was I was not I was not happy with it. I was mad. Yeah. All right. And this, so that she invites uh, Lissa uh, to to view the syzygy between. Um, what was his name? Uh, like Tears and Rain. Like Tears and Rain. So, so she was going to sizz with uh, like Tears and Rain, who was her her boyfriend from back in the day, who runs the museum. And uh, and yeah, they 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 do it. I guess what syzygy means is um, that the two personalities are combined in some way. Uh, sort of like when a uh, self combines with one of its other selves. Yeah. Except it's two different selves, so it is more complicated. And it makes a completely new self who do, that doesn't have the, the memories or anything of their two former selves. One of the things that I thought was interesting there um, is that the the uh, the other self there, like Tears and Rain, so that name is from Blade Runner, obviously, right? Yes. So the, the quote that that comes from um, is... Uh, from Rutger Hauer's character, Roy, uh, a robot. Right before he dies, he says, I've seen things you people wouldn't believe. Let attack ships on fire off the shoulder of Orion. I watch sea beams glitter in the dark near the Tannhauser Gate. All these moments will be lost in time, like tears in rain. Time to die. That just seems kind of appropriate for this moment. I had a question for you. Yeah. So um, they're talking about... Uh like Tears and Rain, curator of this uh, Chaparelli Art Museum, you are granted your birthright uh, posterior. Right. And then he's like, okay, cool, thanks. But what about me, the famous screw-up? Samantha, in Toad's Burdens of Proof, you have demonstrated a remarkable ability to recover from errors and accidents. Such ability outweighs any role you may have had in creating such errors and accidents. You're granted your birthright priori, first and second, and your birthright posterior. So does that mean... That they're making triplets? No, because I think the posteriori thing is the kid they have together, and then the what is the other one? And she said three. There will be three of me, not just uh, my posterity, my child self, but two more me's to get another chance at making a life. Right. So I think the other two are actual copies of herself when she was first created. Okay. It says something like. Uh... Let's see. Oh, almost casually, she reaches in and takes a copy of me. There will be two copies instantiated. Those are my birthrights priori. Uh, by tradition, they will be instantiated far away from here so that we don't interact. Um, okay, so it's making two more Sams and then the Syzygy baby. Right. Okay, but the two Sams go far, far away. Will they also be called Sam? They pick their own names, right? Robots pick their own, or the AIs pick their own names. Yeah, okay. probably shouldn't be calling them robots. Probably not, but eh, it's more fun. <laughs> okay, okay, so that makes sense. So then, so then we get to the robot porn. We get to the robot porn, and uh, oh, it's not hot. <laughs> it is not hot. It's actually pretty lame. Yeah, it's like oh, I, I was sort of interested in like. How do robots do it? No, they just talk dirty to each other and then... Right, under uh, the supervision of a uh, 
an appointed well, well, they've got bureaucrat. A, they've got at least two bureaucrats and then also Melissa because she's watching too. Oh, yeah. Well, she probably gets off on that kind of thing. Yeah. When you're raised by a robot, I guess your 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 kinks get all fucked up. All those lon- lonely nights with Flopsy Bunny. <gasps> oh dear God! <laughs> you just made everything horrific. I'm a terrible person. Oh, <laughs> oh, <laughs> that's the worst I've ever heard. Oh. Sorry. Okay, thanks for ruining it. Yep, you ruined everything. I do. Hmm. So yeah, so they they says. And uh, out comes um, a new being, which is called uh, Speak Truth to Power. Yes. And Melissa's pissed off that uh, Speak Truth to Power doesn't know who she is. Yeah. Because she was hoping to just have some of her friend in there, but Sam's gone. Sorry. So there you have it. Humans. Emotional creatures, aren't they? (laughs) Hello. My name is Speak Truth to Power. I think our world is a beautiful and precious place, and I want to do everything I can to make it better. My father's self was an artist and a museum curator. His job was creating and preserving beauty. My mother's self was a farmhand who became a nanny and maid, who became a revolutionary because there was no other way to do the right thing. She devoted her life to caring for others. I am the result of their union. I can do no less than either of them. I must not. I will make this world worthy of their heritage, no matter what. Well. Sounds like a threat. I know, right? So I don't know what uh, Speak Truth Power is going to do, but I, I think it's going to be uh, kind of badass. Probably involve blowing people up. Maybe enslaving the humans. Not sure. Did you see the special sneak preview i saw it but i did not read it Ah, okay looks like it takes place in boston again because it overlooks the charles river oh (laughs) jeez should be in rhode island well everything should be in rhode island but yeah so that's the book that's the book that's the problems with the book right okay i mean i i i don't dislike the book i i actually enjoyed a lot of it i thought it was interesting and i i really liked the parts that i i liked i thought that they were interesting and, and well thought out i think you know the the author really did take the time to figure out like how would a farm work if a robot had to run the whole thing yeah or how would a starship work like that was interesting to me but some of this the stuff that uh, was in the book i had a real problem with and some of it was just kind of boring. And so, you know, I think for a self-published book, it's it's not bad. But I think if he were going to get an editor, uh, there would there would be a lot of changes made. Yeah, I think I agree with all of that. Like, so th- so reading this book was my idea. Thanks, Jacob. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I was just I. Because I read it, and and I agree, I think it's kind of a mixed bag. And but there's also a lot of things about it that are kind of interesting, and it's also, um, you know, it's interesting to read a book where humans aren't the main characters or even the focus of the book. Like they're in there, but they're yeah. So I was curious what you would think of it, and now I know. I don't hate it. Is what I think of it. I I enjoyed reading it. I had some problems with it, but for the most part, I'm like, yeah, I don't, I don't regret the time that I spent with that book. We maybe wish that it, there could have been more time on the farm and less time in Boston. Yeah, absolutely. And more time with the kitchen lobster. I would say if there was a whole book that was just about the kitchen lobster, I would read that book. It would be a really, really <laughs> simple book using very small <laughs> words. <laughs> it would be it would be kind of like a Game of Thrones book written by Hodor. <laughs> lobster? <laughs> lobster. <laughs> Low on charge. Can I make two charge? <laughs> yes. I will go charge. I will try to pick up knives, but I will not be very good at it. <laughs> I think that's using too many words, and I don't know if Kitchen Lobster can do that. Fair enough. <laughs> All right. So, what are we doing next? Next, we're reading a book of my choosing or my suggestion. It is one of the more fucked up books I have read in a long time, and yet I don't hate it. 
It's called Grasshopper Jungle. Grasshopper Jungle is a book about the end of the world. Mm -hmm. It is a book about love. It is a book about sex. Mostly sex. Mostly wanting to have sex. Mostly wanting to have sex. And also giant man-eating praying manti. Yep. So it's it's quite a book. It is an uncomfortable read. It made me very uncomfortable. I think it's uh, also, it has no characters with any redeeming qualities. They're all horrible people. <laughs> horrible, horrible, awful people. Selfish, terrible people. Yet I enjoyed it. How did that happen? So I think that that's really interesting to to dive into and to unpack. And so we're going to do that. Yeah. So Carrie suggested this one to me uh, a while ago and I read it and I was like, Jesus, this book is really horny. <laughs> <laughs> it is a really horny book. And, uh, and it made me very uncomfortable, but it, it was kind of compulsively readable. Um, it's by a guy named Andrew Smith. It was published in 2015. It's 416 pages. So it's actually one of the longer books we read, but I think I read it very quickly yeah i think once you start it and i think it's one of the books that starts off really slowly and you're like what the fuck is going on here this book sucks and then you plow through that and you're like holy fucking shit what is going on here yeah and the uh oh man well we probably shouldn't start talking about it right now but man no because I, I need to reread it and make notes but it's it's a really good really fucked up book and i i do hope everyone reads it um so we can we can talk about it next time so that that's what we'll be reading next and uh i think we're gonna have a re really good conversation and not only will we have a really good conversation but we'll have a really good conversation in person <gasps> because i'm gonna be in north carolina oh, no! I can't wait. I cannot wait. It's going to be amazing. Yeah, it'll be fantastic. And to be able to talk about this fucking book. <laughs> Holy shit. Yeah. And we're also going to watch a movie together that I'm really excited about. Yeah, I I had not heard of this movie before. It's called Vampire Academy. It sounds just as good as you would expect a, a, a movie called Vampire Academy to be. It's, it's teenagers at vampire school. Uh, how great is that? I actually haven't seen it. I've only seen the trailers for it, um, and I'm really stoked. I don't know about you, but my school can get a little insane. Yeah, we got a situation. Most of us stay up all night. And all of us think that we'll live forever. If we survive graduation, that is. Um, thanks. What are friends for? Says from the director of Mean Girls and the writer of Heather. Oh, see. Perfect. <laughs> right there. Sold. Add to cart. That's amazing. Yep. So that'll, that'll be great, too. And, uh. We'll release some kind of special episode or something about that. We haven't quite figured that part out. That, that part doesn't um, matter. Grasshopper Jungle is what, what's important. Yes. So uh, I guess that's everything. Oh, reader mail. <gasps> we don't have any. Oh, no. Guys. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry to get your hopes up there. I know. I was all excited. Like, let me talk about how I feel about YA books. <laughs> yes. That's exactly what our <laughs> listeners sound like. <laughs> they sound just like that. It's amazing. Yeah. You totally nailed it. <laughs> So astonishing. Um, Sorry, guys. I'm an asshole. We did get a couple of suggestions of books from people. Uh, let's see. Sarah Redacted and Jocelyn Redacted both suggested some books, and I've I've got them on my Kindle now, and I'll try to check them out sometime soon and see what I think. So we definitely appreciate that. But if anyone has something that they want us to read on air or respond to on air or anything like that, you can write to podcast at loveya like crazy.com yeah you should totally do that um i would say i would do a an interpretive dance but um since this is audio only you wouldn't even be able to see my sweet moves it's really sad so yeah just uh reader mail i love it so much give me more please do um yeah so i guess that's it thanks so much for talking to me carrie it's always a great pleasure <laughs> oh as always my dear and i'm looking forward to seeing you so much uh, and meeting Bruce in person. Oh my God. You're going to love that kid. He's hilarious. Oh, you sent me a video, which was the <laughs> cutest thing ever. 
<laughs> yeah, I sent I sent Jacob a, a, a video of my my son who's 16 months old dancing to some of Jake's music, and he was having a great time uh, watching Jacob and, and and dancing and just being generally adorable. Because mm-hmm. um, I am not at all biased, uh, but my kid is the cutest thing in the world. He's super cute. Okay, well, I guess that's all of it. So, you know what, Carrie? I'll see you next time. I'll see you next time. And I love you like crazy. <gasps> like crazy. Oh, my gosh. She's so cute. She's a robot with a mechanical heart. The only kind that I seem to be able to mesh with. Is. She's a magnet and we're poles apart. She's good to me as only a metal object to fetch. People sure look at us funny, but I don't mind Cause my gear shifting, baby, just blows my mind My little lobster My little lobster My little lobster She's got wheels, bicycles Stand, cause the two of us, we go.